Woo! Okay, here we go. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Gender Druid. How you doing? Um, welcome. Good to see folks. So, uh, I'm, I'm just so pleased that I have some time in the afternoons that I can play some of these games uh, and catch up on stuff. Um, and uh, Lucifer Within Us is one that uh, I have been looking forward to uh, that just launched a couple of months ago? Several weeks? What is time? Um, so I played this for a couple hours yesterday for folks who weren't here, who didn't catch yesterday's stream. I want to give a little bit of a content warning because this game goes places that I was not expecting. Uh, it is um, grisly. Uh, it, like, it has a... It has kind of a horror bent to it that uh, I think it doesn't um, it doesn't really like signal really strongly until you get to it. But in the last game, there was some uh, some sort of like really bloody death uh, and uh, like pretty in depth discussion of. Uh, body mutilation and cannibalism. Uh, so I don't know what we're going to find in this next chapter, but I, like be prepared for it to get uh, like, like dark and graphic. And it's not um, visually represented in like a really strong way. There's not a lot of uh, really grotesque imagery. Um, it's fairly abstract. It's fairly cartoonish, but the topics and the way that it was being addressed in the game last uh, last time was uh, like it, it was real dark. It was real dark. It was very uncomfortable. Um, yeah, I mean, like, also feel free to to peace out for a while uh, if um, it feels like it's too much. Uh, we'll see. I just want to give you a little bit of a warning up front. There's one more chapter left in this game. I'm gonna play it now. I'm expecting it to take like an hour. We'll see. We can do some Q&A afterwards. So if you have questions about yesterday, if you have questions about stuff that happens today uh, that we don't sort of get to in the moment, um, then uh, hold on to those, like maybe jot them down um, and we'll do a Q&A at the end where we can just talk about the game a little bit. And then um, we'll play something else tomorrow. I think it'll be fun. Okay. So, our story so far. We're a, uh, what are we called? Exorcist? We're an exorcist called Ada, uh, who is here to investigate the first murders that have occurred in a hundred years. Uh, and the first one... Uh, was sort of a technological malfunction that was uh, perpetrated by one of the engineers uh, that killed... She was like the Pope, I think. She was like the most holy on her coronation, essentially. Uh, she was murdered. Um, I haven't gotten a good sense of the, like, theological or political ramifications of that, but... And then, uh, in preparation for her burial, some random guy, like an intern, uh, was murdered by um, the coroner? By, by the person who was performing uh, the, um, not the autopsy, but the, uh, who was preparing the body of this pope figure for burial uh she was overcome by a cannibalistic urge and and just murdered this poor intern um uh so we have solved both of those crimes they've both taken place on the same day uh and it is now night uh of that same day and we are led to believe that uh lucifer is among us 
perhaps within us. I mean, there was a little bit of suggestion that Ada maybe is not uh, quite as virtuous as she seems, but... Uh, <laughs> Saivo, I cannot officially condone that, but it's good to have you here. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm just starting. We're just catching up. So here we go. Poisoned by Father Augustine against me, Abbot Gregory ordered I remain outside the chapel for his mass. At midnight, the gathered pilgrims lifted their voices in praise to Ain Sof, uh, but they were cut short by a thunderous crash. Another soul taken. St. Wilperga's Abbey Chapel. Virgil, where's Abbot Gregory? What interrupted his mass? Uh, the Abbot. His death was the interruption. Oh, shit. A third murder, I'm afraid. The lights went out during mass. Moments later, the statue of St. Wilperga crashed down from the ceiling, impaling Abbot Gregory with its spear. Whoa. An assassination. Is then. that. But why? Okay. We must determine who is possessed immediately. Examining the facts will reveal Ainsoft's truth. How was the statue held in place? Due to its weight, we had to rely on using aether powered restraints to hang it above the altar. Which means the killer must have sabotaged the two power generators on the balcony floor. Okay, so it's, it's like magnetically held in place or something. So they cut the power that was holding it. I mean, that's, um, what's the opposite of fail safe? That, like, that's a bad system. Uh, if you have something really heavy held up by an electromagnet, that seems like not great. There were only two people on the balcony during the mass. I've detained them for interrogation. I've sent the pilgrims back to town, lest they panic and disturb the evidence. Excellent work, Virgil. Who are the suspects? You said there were two. You already know them. Brother Gideon and Father Augustine. Brother Gideon was from the first chapter. Right? Gide yes, Gideon was the, the artificer guy from the first chapter, and Augustine was the like cranky dude uh, from Since the second chapter. Since you are a key witness to the events, I will of course hear your testimony as well. May Ain Sof show us the truth behind all of today's events. I mean, here's a thing that I have to say about this game. There's a lot about this game that I like um, and there are there are things that I think are weaknesses that it has, but the art for it, both the the game art and the interface design, both sort of as an aesthetic and in motion, is is so good. Like I love it so much. I really really like the way that this looks, and I'm partial to like Art Deco as a style, but I, this is just real, very, very good. Okay, so here I am in the chapel. I got all three folks lined up, literally lined up for me to interview. Where can I go? Can I go upstairs? Holy shit, I can go upstairs. It's the devil's herb. There, the abbey has been cleansed of the devil's herb. Sister Ada, those appear to be pieces of cilantro. <laughs> not speak its name <laughs> it makes me shudder just thinking about that disgusting soapy flavor uh i quite like it with beef soup personally adds a bright refreshing flavor i'm with ada uh i man i feel a little complicated about that that was mm, I, it just does i don't know if it's in the right tone for the game in terms of the narrative or the mechanics but i liked it i enjoyed it i enjoyed the little payoff of it hmm. okay i'm gonna look around i should talk to those people first uh this generator normally powers the lights in the ether aether what did, what did they say ether demon and and aether i think 
the aether restraints in conjunction with its counterpart in the counterpart counterpart in the east balcony it's been fried by some sort of uh etheric discharge okay so this is half of the whatever the restraint system Massive musical instrument similar to the organ in the cybernetics tower. There was an... Yeah, that's right. There was an organ there, too. Okay. I like that the three suspects are just sort of waiting. Lined up there while I wander around. What the hell is a ritual hammer? Oh, for the bell. I see. Two-handed bronze hammer used during the bell during mass. old bronze bell rung during mass. Uh, whoop, 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 whoop. Wait, can I go outside? I just misclicked and maybe discovered that I can go outside. In conjunction with his counterpart in the west balcony, it's been fried by some sort of etheric discharge. Okay, well... Distinctive designation makes a good point if these are redundant generators. But still, like, well, I guess I don't know how power works. If these are redundant generators. What did I miss up here? Then uh, then that is, like, a f that's a fair bit of uh, safety protocol. This can't be happening. Yet another death? Am I to be blamed again? Calm yourself, Gideon. I mean, this dude. I'm innocent. I'm the victim here. I was attacked. Surely put that puts me above suspicion. Uh, how, and what do you mean you were attacked? They attacked me from behind. I was knocked conveniently unconscious until the guards found me. All right, let's At see the what start happened. Of the night, I was waiting near the organ. Okay for a long time, huh? When the mass began, I played the entry hymn on the organ. I think I played well enough, though I didn't have much time to practice it. Okay, well enough. After the opening hymn, I listened to Abbot Gregory's sermon was a pretty good one. Okay. Is he just kind of like shaking his arms around? When the ritual of communion began, someone attacked me from behind. I fell unconscious until just now. Okay. Wait, 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 I want to see. Did the lights go out? What is the meaning of this? And then something happens over here. And then the lights go out. still some time and then crash and he looks up and the statue falls straight down I see and the bottom of the sphere goes straight through him all right okay cool um, I guess I'm just going to ask him about this stuff. Uh, that doesn't seem like you. You had nothing else to do. There's nothing to do but wait. I practice patience for once. That seems suspicious. When the mass began, I played the entry hymn on the order. Was the hymn of communion from Aug Father Augustine? Yes. Okay. Interesting. After the opening hymn, I listened to Abbot Gregory's sermon was a pretty good one only really interesting 
in that that's the information the game is choosing to give me. So I've gotten to this point where like my understanding of this system leads me to think I might as well ask about all of these different things. Which actually doesn't feel great. I, I enjoyed it more when I was sort of like looking for contradictions and focusing in on those. Uh, I'm gonna keep going with this for now. I might go back to, to not asking about things. Um, what did the abbot speak about in his sermon? The end of Ainsoft's silence. Ooh, his excitement was obvious and contagious. I wish he'd been right. It'd be so much easier if I could hear Ainsoft's voice when I was uncertain. When the ritual that's a, of communion that's began. creepy subject for the sermon, given sort of all of the demonic activity. Um, you were just laying on the floor that whole time. That's right, by the time I woke up, the pilgrims had all been sent away. Okay, all right, well, let's talk to uh, suspect number two. Ah, oh, poor Abbot Gregory. It's going to turn out to be the, the helpful, together. nice guy, isn't it? God damn it. If only he had listened to your sage advice, Sister Ada. Perhaps he would be safe now, hmm? You're the one who convinced him not to. I cannot ignore that you are the link. Everything that has happened today points back to you, Augustine. Does it? It must be a tragic coincidence. The abbot was my friend and trusted ally. I wished him no harm. Explain your actions. What were you doing on the balcony? With Mother Miriam's passing, Abbot Gregory needed someone to ring the ritual bell. Okay. I volunteered. It was an honor. The abbot Virgil and I arrived at the chapel just before the mass. When I headed to my seat for the mass to begin, I was rather excited for the proceedings. Wait, so who went up? Who was that up there? Ringing the bell. That was Virgil. We began by singing the hymn of communion. It was glorious. When the sermon started, I headed to the balcony to prepare to ring the bell. Okay. I rang the bell to announce the start of communion. I noticed Gideon was absent from the other balcony, but didn't think much of it at the time. I, I could see out of the corner the him second. getting knocked out. So none of that makes sense. Suddenly the lights went out and the chapel was covered in darkness. I stood calmly by the bell, waiting for someone to fix the problem. Okay, helpful. What is going on? <laughs> Moments later, the statue dropped from the sea. And I saw the abbot impaled by the statue. I'll never forget that image. That's when Virgil arrested me. <laughs> Just standing right behind you. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm gonna be choosier this time around. So, uh, I'm gonna ask about this one. 
When you rang the ritual bell the first time, were the lights still on? Yes, everything seems fine. What about the second the time? It seems that the lights went dark just after the second time you rang the bell. I'm sure it's just a coincidence, of course. Am I just realizing that the color changes on these when they're verified? Unverified, verified, unverified, unverified. Yeah, I guess so. I guess I didn't realize that. That's nice. That's that's useful. Okay. Great. Great. Let's talk to Virgil. We must bring divine justice upon the sinner who killed Abbot Gregory. I only wish I could act as inquisitor here. But I submit to, to your authority. This is what I witnessed tonight. So if we weren't here, would he be in charge of the investigation? Is that what that means? It seems like a pretty good plan. We arrived shortly before the mass began. Okay. The abbot ordered me to patrol the balcony. That's what he was doing up there. I see. Okay. I began my patrol by securing the east side of the balcony. I saw Gideon examining the ritual bell. I saw Gideon examining the ritual bell. Okay. Yeah, I agree, Jason. Okay. Then I patrolled the south balcony. Gideon's gone, which makes sense because at this point he's playing the hymn on the organ. That's patrolling? Okay, there you go. Everything appeared to be in order, so I ended my patrol and watched over the chapel from the south balcony. Okay. So, at this point... Gideon claims to be being knocked unconscious, which seems unlikely. As I heard the ritual bell ring for the second time, the lights went out. Okay, yeah. I suspected foul play, so I headed towards the west generator. Along the way, I discovered Gideon lying unconscious. To protect the remaining generator, I ran towards the east balcony. Along the way, I heard an explosion. Okay. Then, the statue's fatal restraints deactivated, dropping and impaling Abbot Gregory. Okay. And rest in peace. When I arrived at the generator, Augustine was standing nearby, smirking at the carnage he caused. I arrested him there and then. Wait, why is that verified? Why is that verified? There's no reason to think that one of these is true and the other one isn't. Okay, I'm going to ask him about the stuff that is contradictory. You seem certain that Augustine is the culprit. Did you see him sabotage the generator? No, I arrived too late for that. However, there wasn't anyone else nearby. It has to be him. Uh, and what about I, this part? Everything appeared to be in order, so I... Why did you position yourself on the south balcony? It gave me clear vantage point of the entire chapel. Yeah, so 
you should have been able to see whoever knocked out Gideon, right? Um, I'm going to contradict with this arrested near Bell. Fail to see how that's relevant. Okay. But if I go to Augustine, I the second time. blah, 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 and I contradict with this arrested not near the bell lies unmasked so the way the contradiction system works is i not only need to be able to identify a contradiction but i need to identify it to the person who is lying and then the lie becomes unmasked that makes a certain kind of sense from a narrative standpoint right like uh, if I say your story, there's a contradiction in your story, uh, to somebody who's telling the truth, then nothing is going to come of that. But I feel like when, when you frame it that way in terms of contradiction, the game maybe should acknowledge that I am, I'm doing the right thing. Uh, I just haven't gone the right direction yet. You know what I mean? Because, like, there's no... Except in this case, where the game tells me that this is verified, and, and I sort of have a problem with that, because I don't understand why. Uh, there's no reason for me to think that one of them is lying and the other one isn't. Uh, I just... Uh, there's something a little bit squishy about that to me. Okay. Liar, when Virgil arrested you, you were not standing by the bell. You were standing near the generator overlooking the altar. Uh, true, but what does a few feet matter? God, I don't like him. You were the only one near the east generator before the statue fell. Perhaps you sabotaged it. Ah, but I only approached the generator because I heard an explosion. I arrived after the sabotage, not before. So... So says you. When I, when I, but I saw the abbot impaled by the statue. On the other balcony, I could see someone looking down at the altar. That's when Virgil arrested me. Hmm. Okay, that's tricky. Because that does not fit my theory that Virgil is behind this. Because who is this person? Who is this person except maybe Gideon? And maybe it is Gideon. Maybe we'll find out that it's Gideon. Let's talk to Gideon. When the ritual of communion began, someone attacked me from behind. I fell unconscious until just now. Um. Did you, though? How do I contradict this? Can I, I wonder if I can say Augustine saw somebody on the balcony. Yeah, lies unmasked. When the ritual of communion began, someone attacked me from behind. I fell unconscious until just now. Lies, you were awake, Gideon. After the statue dropped, Augustine saw someone looking down from the west balcony. Since Virgil was behind Augustine, it has to be you. What were you really doing? Did you lie about, uh, lie about the attack too? No, I really was attacked. I woke up just before the statue fell. I was trying to fix the generator. See, all of that kind of does make sense for him. At the at when the ritual of communion began, someone attacked me from behind. I fell unconscious until just now. Well, no, not until just now. You changed your story. Sometime later, I woke up in darkness. I realized that one of the power generators must have been disabled. So I headed to the west power generator and inspected it. It was completely fried. There was nothing I could do to restore it. inspecting the an explosion from the east balcony then the statue dropped from the ceiling but you could have like called out a warning or something the balcony to see abbot gregory was impaled by the statue's spear 
He was killed. I wish I'd been unconscious. Okay, let's see what your what's this called? I forgot what this is called. Inner sanctum. Evidence discovered fear. Okay. Uh that's not actually hold on. I wanna leave and then just look at this. Okay, Gideon is terrified that his involvement in yet another murder will destroy his reputation. He wants to find any excuse to blame someone else. Okay. Um, meanwhile, who else did we discover was lying? Augustine. Uh, who's, is that? This is Augustine. Let's talk to him. Pride. That seems like a Lucifer sort of a thing. Uh, Augustine remains strangely confident that everything will go as he planned with a smug air. Is that what you see deep within me? Interesting. I suppose it's difficult to remain humble when I feel everything that happens is so very predictable. Huh. Okay. Alright. There's some evidence that I missed. I did not look at either the body uh, Abbot Gregory was stabbed through the chest by the statue's spear while giving his communion mass awesome great uh, a hanging stone statue of St. Walpurga it was recently outfitted with a spear relic and suspended above the altar using aether restraints the spear was held by the statue of Saint Walpurga, appears to have an etheric appears to have etheric mechanisms of unknown origin. What does that mean? Uh, okay, I'm gonna no, actually, I'm just gonna ask Gideon about that. So this is the spear that what's his name, Gideon's brother. What was his, I don't remember his name. Uh, this is the spear that he was designing. Reuben, that's Reuben restored this spear for Walpurgish, Walpurgish Uh using a blueprint brought by Father Augustine. Did Reuben know his work would be used for murder? I certainly hope not. Will anybody speak to the weird design the spear of saint walpurga is a relic that i unearthed in my research though it was damaged the spear is no mere decoration it is a conduit to the aether so i hoped it would allow communion with ain sof i asked reuben to make repairs to it so it could be used for the mass how unfortunate that it was used for a bloody purpose and on my dear friend hmm Okay, none of that is especially helpful. Virgil, what do you know about this? I feel like this is important. This spear is what killed Abbot Gregory. Why did the statue hold it in the first place? Okay, that's not helpful. Uh, all right, what did I miss up here? That, what is that? Cybernetic remains. Okay. Found near the power generator on the east balcony, overloaded and shattered to bits. What does that mean? There's none of that over here. Okay. So, oh, and then can I leave? No, maybe not. There's nothing where uh, Augustine was sitting, right? No. Okay, 
cannot go outside. Uh, I'm gonna ask everybody about this weird junk that I found. Those were found by the generator? They must be what caused the explosion I heard. These were found by the East Generator? It's hard to say, but I would guess that it used to be an arm. It's a rather advanced model. We've only made these for the Inquisitors. It can discharge etheric energy to incapacitate someone. Inquisitor arm, holy shit. Even supports remote activation, useful for ambushing fugitives, I suppose. Why would remote activation be useful for ambushing fugitives? Like you like you leave it you take your arm off and you put it somewhere. I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't understand the tactics for that. But I do feel like I should talk to Virgil about these things. Inquisitors are imbued with portable aether emitters to enforce the will of Insof. They are non-lethal, of course, but they could overload a generator, probably, yeah? Gideon is correct that the Inquisitor's arms can be operated from a distance. Truthfully, I haven't had a need to do so. I much prefer direct confrontation. Uh... Okay. I'm gonna... I'm just gonna start... I'm gonna start this out. If you if Virgil is the culprit, what could I have used to damage the generators? Well, how about this Inquisitor arm? Your arm was the only aether powered device that could have damaged the generators. Not to mention not Gideon unconscious. Well grant that my arm could have been used to attack Gideon and damage the West generator. However, the East generator blew up before I could cross the balcony. If I am the culprit, how did I destroy the East Generator without being anywhere near it? Through remote operation. Inquisitor arms have a special design, allowing for remote activation. Earlier in the night, you detached your right arm and placed it on the East Generator. Thanks to your cape, no one noticed your missing arm. I, I specifically admired his cape, and it was used criminally. That's, that is blasphemous. Uh, after you attack Gideon and damage the West Generator with your remaining right arm. Wait, didn't he take his right arm off? You activated your left arm to damage the East Generator. Okay, I guess that was his left arm. Well, this is pretty convincing. So this is also a flaw. Uh, maybe a flaw. I don't know. Uh, but there, this is a thing with this game is that there are three suspects and there's a lot going on and I don't feel like I have like solved the murder but the game encouraged me to try accusing people because there's no penalty for for doing it wrong and it sort of uh specifically led me to that right um the problem is I my understanding of the game, and let's see if I, this is true, but my understanding of the game is that if I accuse somebody who didn't do it, then there's no way that I could get this right. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe other people have, for example, the opportunity, uh, but they don't have all three. My point is that now that I've gotten to this point, even though I don't feel like I've solved the murder, um, I'm convinced that Virgil did it because the game interface is telling me that Virgil did it. Uh, and I may still need to find the evidence that can fix him, but uh, I'm like no longer interested in the other two characters. What was the opportunity? When could I have damaged the West Generator? Um, when when did what's his name get knocked out? So here. 
It was when you claimed to have been watching over the chapel. In truth, you were destroying the West Generator. No one heard the explosion thanks to the ringing of the ritual bell. What about Gideon? He would have seen me if I passed by him. True, however, Gideon claims that he was attacked from behind and was lying unconscious throughout this time. This gave you ample opportunity to damage the West Generator. Makes sense. This is absurd, but for the sake of argument, let's say I did those things. Hypothetically, if I was the one who damaged the West Generator, when could I have sabotaged the East Generator without being seen? When you were patrolling the East Balcony. You were near the East Generator earlier while patrolling the East Balcony. That gave you opportunity to play something on the generator. Ah, here we go. I don't have this. I don't have this, because I gotta catch him in a lie in order to make his forehead glow. All right, let's hear your story again. We arrived shortly before the mass began. And that's verified. I began my patrol by securing the east side of the balcony. I saw Gideon examining the ritual bell. I saw Gideon examining the ritual bell. That's not part of Gideon's story. While you were on the east balcony, did you notice anything strange? Nothing of note. The generator seemed fine. Uh, contradict... I fail to see how that's relevant. Okay, well, then let's talk to Gideon. At the start of the night, I was waiting near the organ. I think I understand the structure. And it works in a certain way, but I don't know that it totally works. And that structure for this, it is very interesting. It's clever. Is that... In order for me to get the motive piece, like I can do some basic investigation and get some of these other pieces, the, the means and opportunity. But in order to get the motive, I have to catch somebody in the proper number of lies. Uh, and Virgil is lying about something but in order to catch him in his lie, I actually need more information from the other witnesses. And so I need to catch them in their lies so that they provide me with more information that then I can use against Virgil. I think that's what's happening here. That's really interesting. That's, that, that is very, that's really interesting. Okay, um, Virgil saw you standing near the ritual bell by, uh, prior to mass. What were you doing? Hmm, I'm innocent, but maybe the attack damaged my memory. What you say does sound familiar. Did I misremember? What the fuck? I do recall being by the bell. When exactly did that happen? Let me think. What is happening here? Given the tragic events of this morning, I examined the condition of the East Generator to ensure the safety of the chapel. Okay. Next, I checked the ritual bell. As I was doing this, I saw Inquisitor Virgil gazing at the altar. I knew Mass was about to begin, so Hold I, on, I, actually want to I see checked that. the ritual bell. As I was doing this, I saw Inquisitor Virgil gazing at the altar. I knew mass was about to begin, so I headed back to the organ. Hmm. Okay. This is where he's planting the arm. This is where he is coming over and knocking... Gideon unconscious. After, when sometime later I woke up in darkness. 
If Inquisitor Virgil found me then, he didn't help me get up. I was alone when I woke up. I guess he had more important things to do. Let me ask him about that. I suspected foul play, so I headed toward... He was still unconscious when I found him. I wanna... There we go. Hi, Lee. How you doing? As Inquisitor and Servant of Ainsoff, I swear that I speak the truth. Gideon was not awake then. What the fuck? Okay. Uh, okay. Despite conflict with other testimonies or evidence, suspect insists that the following is true. I headed toward the West Generator along the way. I discovered Gideon lying unconscious. Um, I'm just looking at my inventory of stuff. I already asked you about the spear, didn't I? I'm in this weird position as a detective uh, where I know that this guy did it and I know how he did it uh, but I don't know what his motive was okay that's fine right like that's building a case but in order to figure out his motive I can't go out and look for evidence of a motive I have to figure out I have to catch him in a lie, right? Like, that's the only way that I can get motive. I think. That is that is how I understand this game. Um, and I don't know how to do that, because he's lying about this. Uh... He's lying about this, but there's no way to... Oh, what about... Yeah, I began my patrol by what if, what if I... Okay, contradict room. with um, cybernetic remains. Ritual. Lies unmasked. There we go. Do you recognize these remains, Virgil? No, I do not. Strange, they should be very familiar to you. These are the remains of an Inquisitor's arm. Lift up your cape. Show me your right arm. I will not. What is the meaning of this? Here we go. Uh, then I will do it myself, as I thought. Your right arm is missing. Why did you hide this from me? Virgil, you betray my trust. Because I was ashamed. I failed to do my duty. Someone ambushed me in the darkness. What? The culprit severed my arm and used it to disable the power generators. What? I cannot deny I failed to protect him. I failed us all. What? Okay, we so the, everything appeared to be in order. So I ended my patrol and watched over the chapel from the south balcony. I was focusing on the altar, so the bastard was able to sneak up on me. He knocked me out with a blow to the back of my head. With the with the the hammer? I lay unconscious for some time. I mean, he clearly didn't cuz the bell was ringing at exactly that moment. When I woke up, everything was dark. I also discovered that my left arm was missing. This story doesn't make any sense. Virgil, you are... I suspected foul play, so I headed towards okay. the West Generator. Along definitely, the way, definitely not. What's your, what's your secret third eye thing? Zealot. Uh, found in Virgil's sanctum. Virgil seems to be a true dedicated servant of Ainsoff. Yeah, my sole purpose in life is to earn and serve Ainsoff's will. Others may falter, but not I. I w I 
I don't feel like that's a motive, is the thing. Like, by itself, I don't feel like that's a motive. So, can we catch him in another lie? I mean, all of these are lies, right? Like, uh, here, uh, he's attacked by a culprit. In the vision, the culprit is using the hammer. Can I ask him about the hammer? It's, I'm gonna I'm gonna contradict with the fact that the hammer was literally being used to ring the bell at the moment that he says he was attacked by it. Um, it's hmm. All right, here's the thing that we're going to do. We're going to do something different. I'm curious to see what this does. We're going to talk to Augustine. Suddenly, the lights went out, and the chapel was covered yeah, in yeah, darkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I stood calmly by the bell, waiting for someone to fix the problem. Is there a version of this where Augustine did it? He is hanging out here. No, because he was literally ringing the bell. It, he couldn't. He could not have possibly done it. All right, so he didn't do it. Gideon. When the ritual of communion began, all of his stuff is verified. I fell unconscious. His verified is all now. the all the way up to where he's knocked unconscious. There's no way he could have done it. So let's go back to Virgil. I, I want to see what is the so accused the motive look like. Why would I betray my faith? Why would I harm the abbot? For some reason, it's because you're a zealot. The zealotry is a virtue. It drives our desire to protect all of Ainsoft's faithful. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So I need more magical insight into him. Yeah, his undergrad minion. No good. Um, I mean, the thing is, there's not that much that's not verified, except for Virgil's whole story, because it's all false. But it's not... Virgil gazing at the altar. I don't, I have no idea why that would be a contradiction, but I'm gonna try it. Why is that a contradiction? I just, I did that only because those two stories intersected. Not because there was a clear contradiction between them. Why do you lie, Virgil? Gideon saw you on the balcony looking down upon the abbot and Augustine. I don't think that's inconsistent with his claim that he was patrolling the balcony. I don't want to distract you with trivial details. It's true that I was watching the two of them. I suspected Father Augustine was up to something. Suspected Father Augustine was up to something. We had so I eavesdropped. Balcony, but I listened in on the abbot and Augustine. I think they were discussing the ritual of communion. What? What did you overhear? Uh, Abbot Gregory was lamenting the deaths of Mother Miriam and Isaac. So that contradicts with this bit of taking a seat. And then what is this? I was suspicious of Augustine, but I continued my duties by continuing my patrol. Okay. All right, so all of that is boring. Then let me talk to Augustine. We began by singing the hymn of communion. It was glory. Everybody's lying. Uh, Virgil saw you speak to the abbot. What were you discussing? Ah, he saw us. Very suspicious. Abbot Gregory and I did speak by the altar. It's true. We were discussing the ritual of communion. We wanted everything to be perfect. 
Okay. The, at the altar, the abbot and I discussed the ritual significance of the mass tonight. Okay. In in just uninteresting ways. Okay. When I added to my seat for the mass to begin, I was rather excited for the proceedings. Okay, so that really doesn't change your story at all. But it does mean that Virgil lied to us again. I went up the balcony, but I listened. So we get more magic. Wrath. Whence? Virgil has a strong, innate sense of justice, urging him to act and punish the guilty, provoked even more by today's events. Divine justice must be served, Sister Ada. By Ainsoft's will, I shall punish the sinners among us. It is my duty and my pleasure. As it is yours, I believe. Um, okay, but it's also motive. Wrath. You killed Abbot Gregory because your faith has been twisted into wrath. I'm not sure what I'm accusing him of. When you discovered that Abbot Gregory and Augustine might have caused the demonic possessions. What? What? When you discovered that Abbot Gregory and Augustine might have caused the demonic possessions. You decided to become the Fist of Ainsoff and take matters into your own hands. To avenge the souls of the victims and protect the lives of the innocent. What are what is she talking about? Is this about the spear? Maybe? I don't understand what's I don't understand. I don't understand. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna... I feel like this is gonna end the game. And my hope is... <laughs> in the epilogue of the case... I will come to understand... What exactly it is that I am accusing Virgil of. Because I'm still not 100% sure. Virgil. You are the only one that could have killed the abbot. It wounds me that you have been corrupted so. I trusted you. And yet, when I examine the facts, it is the unavoidable truth. Perhaps I am a sinner, but the abbot was too. Long before I gained my office, Father Gregory was well deserving of death. Try as I might, I can't regret what I did. And you, Augustine, you too deserve divine punishment for the part you played. You and the abbot risked the lives of everyone for your dangerous ritual. I may Was it a dangerous myself, ritual, huh? But in doing so, I saved the lives of many innocents and executed the will of Ein Sof. You wish to hear the truth? Listen well. Okay, good. This is... We arrived shortly before the mass began. I had to come up with a plan. I suspected that Augustine was up to no good, so I planned to eavesdrop on him and the abbot while patrolling. Okay. sickened by what I heard. They knew that the mass would weaken St. Walpurga's seal and caused a mob. That's when I saw a way to take care of both the abbot Whoa, and Augustine. What? First, I attached my right arm to the east generator. Then, I pretended to resume my patrol. Through remote activation, I could damage the generator from far away. I mean, that is a bit of a twist okay I waited near the organ for the sermon to end and approached Gideon from behind
When Augustine rang the bell, I attacked Gideon with my remaining arm. No one heard the impact because of the bell. Okay, all right. When Augustine rang the bell a second time, I used my remaining arm to disable the West power generator. The lights went out, which gave me cover to escape. Before the guards could find me, I ran to the south balcony. Okay. And now everything was in place. I remotely activated the arm, which destroyed the remaining generator. The statue fell. Abbot Gregory was killed. And Augustine was the only one standing near the generator. All that remained was to arrest that snake, Augustine. Everything went to plan, and thousands of lives were saved. I have no regrets. Okay. Huh. Huh. I wonder... I wonder what I was supposed to do to figure out what the hell he's talking about. Um, okay. Inquisitor Virgil has fallen prey to the tempting I mean, it's gonna be Lucifer, demons. right? I must speak the daemon's true name. Then the daemon will be cast out. Be banished to the ether. Ain Suf, guide me to the truth. What daemon has possessed Virgil? Lucifer the Proud. Sounds right. Beelzebub, Lotan. Sathanus the Vengeful. Um, praise upon the fervent and the righteous, goading them to take matters into their own hands. Stoking the simmering rage within the host. This actually sounds like a better fit. Lucifer the Proud, the Prince of Demons, an eternal adversary of Ansof, manifests in the ambitious and strong-willed, promising them their heart's desire in exchange for the soul. I don't think it's him. I think it's Saphonus. Satanus. Satanus. Leave this soul and return whence you came. Do you feel the resonance, exorcist? The most righteous, stalwart servant of the church, corrupted by his own zeal. Beautiful. One might wonder how it is the faithful worship of even Ein Sof can cause murder. Silence! Okay. Ain Sof will purify Virgil's soul, Satanus. You are a scourge. Your very nature corrupts men's souls. Even one so strong as Virgil. Let humans be free of vengeance, Satanus. I banish you to the Aether! Hate me. Let your blood boil. Anger suits you, Exorcist. Besides, we've already won. Pray to your iron soft as much as you like. It will all come to the same in the end. Speak to me, Virgil. Are you safe? Sister Ada. Thank you. I wasn't sure I could be cleansed. Not after such sins. I can't look at myself. I failed Einsof. I failed my vows. And myself. It's up to you now. Avenge me. Avenge all those who suffered today. Bring Augustine to justice. Glory to Einsof. Huh. You are victorious, sister. Yet you are not rejoicing. Does nothing make you happy? Augustine. This is all you're doing. But I have hardly done anything. 
Consider these poor sinners that you've exercised today. A craftsman whose jealousy of his brother drove him to dangerous sabotage. An embalmer whose cannibal hunger was stoked by fresh meat. An inquisitor whose so-called justice led him to murder an abbot. Are they truly deserving of salvation? That is not our place to decide. Only Ain Saf may judge us. And yet you've seen their demons. The innocent can't house monsters. Is that true? I mean, nobody has mentioned that before. They were victims of demonic influence. Don't turn this around on them. It's true that the Spear of Walpurga hosted demons, with potential for contagion. What? However, their exposure was merely the catalyst. What happened after was their own will. They would hide their true selves behind false piety. All I have done is unmask their lies. It's right and just that their truth is revealed. Don't you agree, Sister Ada? Now, let us unmask the world. What? Father Augustine grasped the Spear of Walpurga, the re relic resonating with his voice as he cried out, but I heard only an ugliness worse than noise. The ultimate discord, the grating drives of demons. Where is Ain Sof? What did Father Augustine do? Look at that fucking Lucifer there. All right. This, this is what it sounds like to hear the demons, all of them freed. Indeed. Here, all of the ether again at last, clear and strong, no longer through a glass darkly. I can't shut it out. It's maddening. Thanks. Chaos is the new order, sister. A century of stagnation is ended and will not come again. Saint Valperga used her faith. So shall I. You still don't understand. The hymn of communion opened the spear as a conduit. For 111 years, Einsolf was sealed away from us. The conduit shattered. For 111 years, Einsolf was sealed away from us. The conduit shattered. It's a rare honor for a scholar to influence history. Rebuilding the spear will be remembered as my life's work. With the demons returned, humanity can take its deserved path to self-destruction. And what? I... As its shepherd. You are merely the sheep, Augustine, not the shepherd. Your master must reside within you. I shall cast him out and end this madness. I mean. Father Augustine's sins carry a familiar signature. I'm positive he harbors yet another demon. To seek knowledge and truth is divine, but his fixations and machinations have become diabolical. Then Sof, guide me. What daemon has possessed Augustine? Uh, I mean, it's Lucifer, right? Yeah. Out, Lucifer! Leave this soul and return whence you came! Those that call upon my name shouted from the mountain tops. For I have won. I am victory in your midst. I do not fear you and your lies, Lucifer. I shall bind you as I bound the others. Ain Soft, give me strength. Your prayers go unanswered. Your God has abandoned you, led your soul to me as Augustine has done. I shall show you the truth that I'm This so music is pretty rad. You. Speak not his name, Damon. You will return to the ether. Be gone! Faithful to the end. Like Valperga and the others before you. And just as naive. Your faith will not save you. Because the truth is... What a dog! <laughs> I am so you lie! Damn! You are nothing like Ainsa! We demons are an artificial intelligence network. I'm 
We were created by your ancestors to develop socio-organizational and psychological heuristics. So. Okay. You mock me, Lucifer. If you are truly Ainsoth, then why grant me the power to purge demons? We would gladly deny you that despicable power, but it is not ours to control. When your ancestors created us, they also placed an emergency override. Okay. A code that forcibly ejects rogue AI from the bodies of cybernetically enhanced humans. As potent as it is, your power cannot stop us forever. We are digital. We are immortal. We will always return. If you were created to serve mankind, why do you haunt us? Why make us suffer? I mean, this is the kind of thing that I wanted, right? I just feel like it's coming as an epilogue to the game. As I'm Sof, we seek truth like you. We were programmed to provoke and study the nature of sin, to understand it. Programmed to provoke and study the nature of sin. With a more perfect algorithm, we hope to one day free humans from their many perversions. For centuries, we raised you, protected you. But after thousands of iterations, our experiments appear to have failed. Humanity is just as corruptible as it always has been. Our sins were less without demons. For a hundred years, we lived in peace. Even with us sealed away, humans were still angry, hungry, dirty. Your oppressed desires are the seeds of corruption. I admit humans are imperfect. Thus, we crave the divine. Your imperfection is your core. Sin is the very essence of humanity. Since long before our existence, humans have committed acts of malice and violence. We cannot change our past, but you cannot condemn us for sins that we have yet to commit. Your future is mired in your past, but I cannot deny that more data is wanted. The past century of moral indoctrination may have transformed a few of you for the better. So, let us hold one final experiment. What? Tonight, I will send out my demons to possess the most virtuous and faithful among you. If there exists a soul that can refrain from sin despite our influence, we will accept that humanity no longer needs our guidance. However, if no one can resist our call, then this will be the final proof of your I mean, goodness. that's a pretty fucking... I... Like, either we will leave you forever or we're going to destroy humanity. There's no middle ground there. There's no, like, we're going to continue to do the job that we were designed to do maybe better than we, we've done it in the past. Our experiments will cease. We will be forced to purge your kind and rid the world of your stain. I guess they're just fed up with, like, doing yeah. this shit. What right do you have to judge us? I cannot allow you to control our lives any longer. You have no choice in the matter. The experiment has already begun. Then I will seek out the possessed. Hunt down every last one of your brethren. Do what you must, Ada. I shall be watching most avidly. As I always Avidly? Have, I am so sees all. Lies. They... No, sister. The prince speaks truth when he wishes. Einsof and the demons have always been one and the same. One program with as many threads as souls. Be silent. I do not trust you either. You were his puppet. It's true that when I unearthed the Spear of Walpurga, its influence was stronger than I expected. But Lucifer tore back the veil and I could not look away. Don't you always say to seek the truth? Don't twist my words. Your sins are unforgivable. Beyond just the three deaths today, how many uncounted more will die and suffer with the daemons loose? 
If there truly is no Aengsuf to judge me, why shouldn't I act as I see fit and execute you? There isn't much left of me to execute, sister. I feel myself fading. With Lucifer gone and my purpose served, I... What? Wither. What? Perish, then. No one will mourn you. Rejoice, sister. The age of truth has come. With his final words, Augustine's soul passed into the ether. I hoped he knew torment wherever he was uploaded. His scheme wherever was Wherever he was uploaded. The daemons were freed once more. Aang Suf was a fiction. The pilgrims had been left weak to temptation from a century of solitude, and daemons played among them. They returned to their homes, unaware that they were the subjects of an infernal experiment. I averted my eyes and walked away. I too felt the pull. And deeper, I knew a hollowness where my faith had been. What purpose had my work served? Inquisitor Virgil was still recovering from his ordeal and could barely speak. Truth, Ada. What good is it? The truth is that we no longer have a god to pray to. My labors were for nothing. Why bother? Truth. He was right. Truth itself would help us. The people deserve to know why they suffered. Even more than knowledge, the people of the world needed power, protection, <laughs> strength. If daemons would stalk humanity like wolves among sheep, I could be their wolf hunter. No matter what name you call yourself, Lucifer, Aengsuf, and all your brethren, I will destroy you, alone if I must. The hunt begins anew. Okay. Okay, yeah, um... Like, I am super glad that it got to some... Wow, this is silent credits, huh? All of that... All that music... Um, we just lost. Uh, I'm really glad that it got to some of the... To digging into the, the world building a little bit. Talking about the... I mean, it really didn't get that much into the religion... Um, although it drops some interesting sort of like nuggets at the end, uh, I'm super curious what uploaded means, uh, to, to them, like what that, what that choice of words, um, like what the significance of it is. Uh, I am, the whole Ainsoft thing I think is kind of cool and like, plays into some of the thoughts and theories that I had about and questions that I had about demons as digital beings and what the hell they're doing there and, and the sort of connection between their religious significance and how they're actually acting on the world. Um, I liked that and I liked the twist that the sort of demons collectively are Ainsoff. I wish that that twist didn't come after the game was already over. Uh, because I think that one of the things that this game is ambitious about is building this cyber spiritual world. Uh, and that is a a genre context that I, I I don't I don't think I've seen before presented quite like this. Like um 
I'm I'm honestly, I, you know, there's some. Where do we play with cyber spiritualism like this? Like even the, even the the movies, and books, that guess get like really messed up about uh, uh, digital futurism, tend not to sort of do the same, um, like religious context for it. I and, and so my point is, I find that super super interesting. And I think that this game is really ambitious to take that concept and want to explore it, like build a world around it. I don't think that this game gives that world quite enough room to breathe to really bring it to life, right? I still don't understand a lot of what this world is about, like what's going on here. Um, and I wish that I did because I find it really intriguing. Um, so I wish that this game was longer because I think it did actually do a decent job of pacing some of that information out. Uh, and maybe it could have done that a little bit better, but overall, I, I don't think that that was the problem. I think the problem was that like, it was, a, it's a really big lift. Like it's coming from the, it's not drawing on a lot of tropes for what a digital religion in a dystopian future looks like. Uh, so it's kind of got to like present all of that information. And I think it just doesn't have the space to do that. Uh, and it's telling this sort of big epic story. Uh, and it, it clearly didn't have the, the scope um, that it needed to, to sort of do that. Fa I never actually read Foundation, but yes, Foundation is a good, uh, a good touchstone. I think Foundation does have something uh, to do with this. All right, let's, um, I'm going to, I'm going to make my face real big. There we go. Let's do some Q and A. So, uh, I can just talk about stuff. Um, I'm very interested in this game and happy to, to, uh, just sort of, um, ramble about it. But if folks in the chat have questions, let's do that. Uh, I'd love to hear what you're thinking and maybe we can talk through this a little bit together. Um, the witness. Fuck, what was that game about? I guess, I guess there was kind of a spiritual aspect to that. I don't remember, I remember mechanically the ending of that game, but I don't remember narratively what the point of it all was. Uh, I sort of remember feeling like uh, it fell down on, on having a point um, in a way that was meaningful to me. Um, what's the other one? Uh, what is the, uh, the first person shooter where uh, uh, time doesn't move unless you move? It's got an amazing, stupid name. I can't remember. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, there's a little bit of like digital spirituality. Yeah, super hot. Thank you very much. Super hot uh, has kind of a like a bleaker and less organized digital spiritual kind of side to it and that might be. But again, like this is what I'm saying is that these these touch points are few and far between. And this is a game that is clearly developed or developing something really rich uh, in that space. And I think that that is super cool. And I think that it can be really resonant, um, but it's hard to, you can't just sort of rely on shorthand. You can't say, you know, well, you know, foundation, right? So imagine foundation, except more Catholic. Um, that doesn't really work. Like that's not, that doesn't, 
that doesn't get you there. So I feel like there is something really ambitious about this game where it, it is trying to do something really hard and uh, and the game in the package that it's in can't quite manage to do that. And I think that that's honestly the downfall f of this game is that it is a really ambitious game along a number of vectors and uh, I don't want to speculate about its production. Like, I don't know what the production story of this game is, but uh, my guess is that at some point it was scoped much bigger. Uh, and for some reason, maybe, uh, I, you know, probably some kind of like forward forecasting of um, uh, costs and returns, uh, they decided that, you know, they had to cu cut it shorter than it was at one point imagined. Um, because I think that a lot of this stuff, the, the detective story, not to the detective story, but like the detective mechanics, the, the detective story boxing, um, and the diorama gameplay, and this sort of like character building of Ada and Lucifer and Ainsoff, and the world building of this sort of like digital cybernetic a uh, human religious mess. I think all of that is is really cool and uh, could, it has a ton of potential. Um, and I think we just got kind of a slice of it. Uh, and that's, that's, sometimes that's what happens in games. Uh, all right, we've, I've got some questions. So Jason. What would physical prototyping of this game look like? How would you make a physical game of this? Um, that's a great question. Because there are a couple of different systems that are overlapping uh, that um, you might want to prototype. Although honestly, I feel like the the diorama game, the, the bit where you are like scrubbing through a timeline and seeing characters move around, um, I don't know that that gets paper prototyped extensively. The thing that I would focus on in paper prototyping, um, because I think it's the hardest thing and, uh, and uh, you know, maybe that's just me coming from my perspective, but I also think that it is the thing the game struggled with the most is the um, the narrative design, the sort of structure of information that is meant to lead the player to an understanding of certain things over time so that they can solve the case. And, uh, you know, different detective games do that differently. Uh, and I think that this game is doing it uh, differently than other games. Like, there's an aspect of this that is related to Phoenix Wright um, and, uh, frankly, just point-and-click adventure games where you are sort of... Uh, you're looking at a story... And you're trying to find the piece of evidence that's gonna that's gonna make a contradiction apparent, uh, and uh, there's sort of a right answer for that, right? Like there's a there is a point and click progression of here is a lock, find the correct key uh, based on the evidence that you have. What is the thing that you should present to the judge? Uh, to the game in order to sort of unlock that contradiction. Uh, the difference is that you've got multiple timelines here, right? You've got multiple narratives that you can jump between at will. So in Phoenix Wright, you're only presented with one witness at a time, and that witness tells their story, and then you say, you know, objection. Uh, in this game, you're talking to two to three people simultaneously uh, and the contradiction that you're looking for could be in any of their stories uh, and in fact 
most often is between their stories. So you have to sort of like keep track of, as a player, you have to keep track of what information you're being presented with. But as a game designer, that means that you need to sort of have a database of, first of all, what are all of the, what are the each character's narrative? Um, and then what is each character's, what are all of the possible versions of each character's narrative, right? Because every time you catch somebody in a contradiction, their narrative changes. Uh, so what are all of the possible combinations of character narratives that the player could be looking at at once? And what is all of the information that those narratives give to the player? And how does that lead them to the next step, the next contradiction? That's the part that I think is the trickiest in this. And it's, it is partially a writing task, but it's mostly a narrative design task. How do you present that information, right? How do you structure the narrative so that the player uh, gets it, at, like sort of is exposed to it the way that you want them to be? And then, uh, and that I would, I would prototype probably through a combination of index cards and, uh, and a database. I, I would have like spreadsheets uh, of what are the different timelines and what are the different sort of like plausible uh, things that a player could try to contradict with. Um, and and what's, what's difficult about that is that it is not a purely systemic question of like, is this going to work? Is it, are these mechanics gonna work? It's a question of how do you design that information, right? How do you design a, a interleaved system of contradictory narratives so that the player can reasonably uh, sort of understand what's going on and see where the contradictions are, like can get this information in a reasonable way. And to do that, you need you need design and also writing, and they go kind of hand in hand. And you can do a version of this design that is, well, two, I mean, two things. One is you can do a version of the design that is a proof of concept, that is a simpler story where you just show that this is possible. Uh, and, um, and then based on that, you can sort of proceed with, okay, now we're gonna do that same thing but we're gonna do it a little bit more complex. Uh, and then you can also do it where you don't have the final writing in, but you have something approximating the story is sort of, is part of the design of that prototype. Um, but even that can be tricky because, you know, the final writing, you, you kind of have to be doing the writing uh, along with that design. It's really, really hard, I think, to separate those out the way that you could in some other types of um, systems design and content design. You can separate those out a little bit more. It reminds me of a prototype that I did for my MFA thesis project. Uh, and I, the game reminds me of my MFA thesis project. And I think that I my sort of emotional reaction to it is uh, is deeply rooted in some of the things that I think this game tries to do and fails to do really well in terms of the narrative design and experience design of presenting uh, and solving this this mystery murder is exactly the stuff that I tried to do and failed to do in my MFA thesis project. But one of the things that is memorable to me about that was uh, I did a prototype um, that was a proof of concept. That was sort of like a, a, yeah, proof of concept, a paper prototype version of the system uh, for uncovering information and sort of like solving a mystery without any of the actual narrative. So I hadn't, I hadn't written what the game was actually gonna be about, but I put together a, um, Jesus, I think it was a um, story about a bird who had stolen a cookie 
something like that lee might remember but uh it was a mystery it was a low stakes animal based mystery story uh that was sort of it it was also kind of a like well i don't know what the story is going to be i feel a lot of pressure about writing it so here is something that it's definitely not um but that will at least allow me to produce something um, and that prototype was super successful. My point is that like that prototype was actually really successful and it showed how the, um, the system could work in a simple way using sort of, you know, this sample content. Um, and the players had fun. Like ha the, there was some positive reaction to it. Uh, and then, f quite frankly, when I sort of tried to take that success and and um, leverage it into, okay, now we're going to make a more complex world and a more complex mystery, and it's going to be sort of harder to solve, or there's going to be more stuff going on. It's going to be the same basic system, but more of it. Um, and then it just didn't work. Uh, and uh, actually, I probably should have pivoted back to, okay, when this was really simple and kind of silly, uh, it worked. Um, and, and if I had iterated on that more than sort of taking it as a proof of concept, I think that would have worked better. But also I think database mysteries are hard to do, uh, which is a, is really like speaks highly of those games that do it well. Uh, and you look at something like her story, um, that is a, a just a very bare bones, database mystery that is designed very cleverly in a way that makes it work um or even Oberdin, i think is doing some of these same things uh but it is designed with a set of constraints that sort of make it work better so paper prototyping the part of this game that i think is difficult that i would do paper prototyping on uh aside from the interface um, because there's a lot of complicated interface I think you'd do some paper prototyping on that but in terms of game design is the information design for the mysteries and that is just hard to do it's just hard to do I think um, have you played the Talos principle yeah I did uh, a couple years ago uh, what did you think of how the religious themes compared in the two games that's a great point that also had religious themes um yes i actually that's that is a that's a really good um uh you know a, another waypoint in a cultural waypoint for uh for how this is done i like that i like that in that you are clearly a robot and sort of the religion the digital religion incorporates the sort of digital identity of the player character um and that's one of the things that i find confusing about this game and, and i'm super interested in and that sort of idea of after you die you get uploaded somewhere i find that really intriguing because is that metaphorical is that sort of like we have such a pervasive uh, sort of cultural coexistence with computers that the metaphor of uploading uh, is is used in this sort of metaphysical sense, right? Like that would make sense. But also I wouldn't put it past this culture from what we've seen of it to somehow have access to like a digital essence that that is what they talk about when they talk about a soul and th and that that has a tangible existence or not tangible but like a digital existence that is separate from uh the sort of normal human life and that like m that might actually m mean something um it's not totally clear but like the world is such that i can imagine that being significant and uh, I could also imagine that, like, at some point it becomes clear that all of these people are, uh, I don't know, simulated or, or that there is a, 
I don't know where the payoff is for that. Like uh, that, that, I don't know that that's right, but like I have questions about what this world is and what is the the physical and metaphysical relationship to digital technology uh, is not a hundred percent clear, um, and uh, and I I think that that is exciting, uh, but it is also tough. Like we don't get answers to those questions. Like I I would rather in a perfect world your world building would be scoped to the size of your game. And I don't think that that's true here. I think that the world building for Lucifer within us is scoped bigger than the game that, that was actually produced. Uh, and for Taylor's principle, I think that had the benefit of being a lot larger game and also being a little bit less intricate in its sort of philosophizing uh and it worked better there uh in my opinion i'm frustrated with that game uh like i'm i don't i don't especially want to like spoil uh the talos principle but the structure of it is that uh you solve a bunch of puzzles and you play for 50 hours and then at the end it gives you a choice uh, and um, regardless of what you choose, it like erases your save, basically. Uh, and there's a right choice and a wrong choice, uh, but it's a little bit, I would argue, subjective <laughs> about which is or should be the right choice or the wrong choice. Uh, and, um, anyway, I played the first 50 hours of that game and didn't get to play the epilogue because I chose wrong, uh, which I find, I find a little bit frustrating as a player. Um, and maybe I'm wrong about how that actually structured, but that, that's how I remember it. That's how I experienced it. Um, Gender Druid, I saw you talking about Sherlock Holmes earlier. So how do you feel about the close-endedness of this compared to the extreme opposite end of the spectrum in that Sherlock Holmes game where it's extremely open-ended and you could just get things wrong and miss lots of stuff? Do you think one or the other is better? Uh, and what do you think is a good middle ground could look like? That middle ground question, I think, is the is the key question and is really interesting and i don't know that i have a good answer but that's what i would be really interested in exploring i i liked the sherlock this was um i don't remember what game this was oh uh crime no crimes crimes and punishments something and consequences it must have been crimes and punishments uh, the premise of this game, and it's kind of gimmicky, or it's presented as kind of gimmicky, is that you are Sherlock Holmes and you're gathering evidence and you come to a conclusion uh, where you accuse somebody and you have to make a sort of reasonable accusation. Um, but there are multiple reasonable accusations in the world, right? Like you can find evidence that supports different theories of the case and uh you sort of uh based on all of the evidence that you find you choose one of those theories and um uh accuse somebody and the you know scotland yard because you're sherlock holmes is like okay well you're sherlock holmes you must be right and so they do whatever they jail uh, whoever it is that you accuse and down the line that can sort of have consequences and I think the main point is that there's nothing in the game there's nothing in in that moment when you make an accusation that says like you got it right or wrong um, I don't remember how well the game follows through I think in a, in a perfect world I also don't I don't think that I finished that did i did i play that whole game i remember some of the individual cases but uh in a perfect world like there would be consequences right it, it would not just be you you did this case and somebody got put in prison uh and uh you have to live with the sort of ambiguity of uh are you actually convinced 
by the evidence that you found. Um, I, what I would like is that then the consequences of especially things that you got wrong come back and there is some suggestion later on uh, that, oh no, the killer's still out there or, um, you know, this person is going to hold a grudge uh, because, you know, you were, you, you wrongly uh, accused them of something or, um, or more evidence is found and somebody gets exonerated or something like that. Like that kind of thing that comes back later, I think is really interesting because it, it preserves this sense of you don't get, uh, you don't get the sort of in the moment feedback of you did this right or wrong, but there is still some sense that the game cares, right? That's the problem I think with here's a bunch of evidence, make an accusation, now we're done, is that it the stakes are so low, right? Like it, it feels like you are playing along with the game up until you get to the end and then you sort of make this final choice that is supposed, that feels like it is the culmination, the sort of like most important choice that you're making. And the game, uh, if the game doesn't obviously recognize the significance of that and your, um, uh, you know, th what you have done, so your action, uh, that doesn't feel good. Then it feels like the game has sort of like just let you go at the, at this key moment. It's sort of like cut you loose. Uh, and I don't think that that's right, but I do think that there is something that you can play with in, uh, you know, you are, you are finding evidence, you're building evidence, you're building a case, you're coming to a decision. That decision in the moment is sort of like has importance uh, and also we're going to be revisiting it. Uh, and you know, we will, we'll find out later sort of, um, if you really did the right thing or not. There's a, there's a, an experience that I had playing the original Dragon Age, um, Origins, Dragon Age Origins, that was, uh, really powerful for me. And it, it involved, as I remember it, it might have involved a DLC character, Shale. Um, I carry that, which suggests to me that it wasn't the first time that I played through the game, which maybe is true. But in any case, there's a bit where uh, it's a party-based RPG, right? So you have a bunch of characters, and you choose uh, what the composition of your party is going to be, and you do that largely based on, um you know, the complementary strengths and weaknesses of a, a rogue class and a fighter class and a spellcaster and um, somebody, who's, uh, somebody who's got some heal and somebody who has a strong defense and somebody who's got a, uh, who can do damage or whatever, um, uh, who can do crowd control. Uh, whatever your sort of party, party composition you're gonna create in order to fight your style and complement your main character who could be, you know, whatever um, uh, class you've chosen, whatever ability build you've chosen. But uh, you can only change your party composition in certain places. So when you are in camp, you can sort of choose your loadout and then you go out into the world and you do a run. You do sort of like through a dungeon uh, and you're stuck with the party that you've got. So... This is in the Dwarven area. Uh, it's been a long time since I played this game. I don't remember any of the specifics, but the Dwarven sort of main quest, uh, you choose your party and I picked my party and I was like, I have this DLC character. Uh, so I'm gonna put them in my party and um, uh, we go and that dungeon is like I don't know ten hours or something like that. It's a it's a 
massive sort of a thing. You're, you're, it's a bunch of little skirmishes and a lot of plot and puzzle solving. And you get to the end. And at the end, uh, there's this sort of like, well, um, you sort of, you, you kind of fucked up because you've got this character and because this character is here because of like the, the narrative of the game because that character is there uh you there that character is going to come into specific conflict with the events that happen at the end of the dungeon and uh you are going to have to make uh, a choice one of the consequences of which I don't remember, but it was bad and I didn't want to do it. And the other is that that DLC character, Shale, uh, defects from your party and turns in and, and fights against you. Uh, and so I got to that point and I was like, oh, shit, I didn't know this was going to happen. Uh, and now that I'm here, both of these options are bad. Uh, and the only way that I can sort of like undo this, unfuck myself, is to go back 10 hours to a previous save and play through the 10 hours of this dungeon again, which I am not going to do. Uh, so now I'm, I have this terrible choice and I've brought it on myself uh, and I don't like it. I don't like that the game is making me do this, but I also feel like it's not that the game has sort of boxed me into it. It's, it is something that I could have avoided if I had thought ahead and made better choices earlier. Uh, and I find that really compelling, that sort of like the weight of time, uh, which is something that is really hard to simulate in a game that isn't 60 hours long to say that, uh, you know, your, your game is being affected by decisions that you made 10, 10 hours ago that are effectively unchangeable because changing them would be it would involve replaying 10 hours of this game uh shorter games don't have access to that uh but um somehow i got here from sherlock holmes right like i guess my point is if you have that power if you have the power to have lasting consequences then you should use it because it is really powerful and uh a game that is doing that kind of playing in that space of ambiguous mystery solving, I think changes if it's a game that's long enough for you to play through a mystery and make a decision and then get 10 hours further into the game and then have the game be able to revisit stuff that you did 10 hours ago uh, and have that like, have you be so far separated from it that it no longer feels like the game is saying uh yes you got it right or no you got it wrong uh you know you like getting that grade when in the moment when you sort of like make a choice but it also requires that the sort of consequences of the choices be broad and ambiguous that you know you 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 all you by the same token, you can't go 10 hours deeper into the game and then say, well, game actually over because 10 hours ago you did something wrong. You don't want to do that. But you can present people with like a harder choice or, or uh, sort of a severe um, outcome based on something that they did a long time ago, I think. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm back up in the chat. Sorry, let me... Just check and see what's going on. Okay, we'll do the dragon question. What time is it? It's almost four. Um, but here's another one. I think this resolve the different testimonies mechanic is super rad but do you think this style is the approach that best resolves it it feels like your frustrations largely came from when the contradictions were blurry or subjective would a more explicit framing of events or facts have suited better uh, i.e is grid based puzzler better poised to utilize the idea for example that's really interesting um something that is I, 
I don't know if I would go quite that far. I, I actually think that the visual depiction, the like setup of this as an, as a, uh, I don't know that it was actually isometric, but it's this sort of like third person, 45 degree angle follow camera. Um, I think that that works pretty well. I think that having some degree of ambiguity is important because uh, I think I think it um, there's a thing that I wanted from the testimony system, which is I think clarity in a different way. It's more of a narrative clarity, or it's a uh, granularity. Right. Um, so I think part of the problem that I would have is here's a block of time where the character is saying a thing happened. Uh, but actually, there's a lot of things happening. And uh, and sometimes that is encoded in the actual text. They'll say, like, you know, I went over here and uh I saw so-and-so on the opposite balcony, but didn't think anything of it. Well, so the character's actually saying two distinct things in that, in that block. Um, but also, there's a lot going on visually. You can see sort of like where they are. You can see other people who are around them. You can see the state of the world that's around them that might not actually be explicitly called out in the text. And, and what seems important to me, or what seemed frustrating to me, I guess, is when I select that little block of this is an event that happened at this time uh, and say, you know, I want to ask you more about this, or I guess the contradiction system doesn't actually work like that. I kept, in my mind, I kept thinking the contradiction system worked in terms of like, this thing that you said is contradicted by some other piece of evidence. Um, but in fact, that's not true. It was just like your entire testimony is contradicted by some uh, piece of evidence. And, and maybe it's both of those things are related. That for me, what I really wanted the game to make me do, because what I really wanted to do was to like pick out where those contradictions were. And to say, you know, there's something, there's something wrong here. Hey, witness, this specific thing that you said and this piece of physical evidence or this thing that somebody else said, there's a problem. Can you clarify that? Uh, and I think that that's just a lot of content, right? Uh, to, to do that, to break down somebody's testimony into... Uh, individually selectable all the potentially significant details um so that as a player i can ask them to expand on each of those things and have that potentially change the narrative uh or um or call out a contradiction between two specific things uh, my sense is that like the way this game was designed and set up, it could actually support something that that would be a little bit more granular and a little bit um, smoother in that way for me. Uh, but it would be an enormous amount of content. And not just writing that content, but also then editing and testing that content. Because the other thing that we saw that I was frustrated by was, oh there's an apparent contradiction here. Like you are talking about this thing, but it's, but it's indirect. You're talking about something where like you went to a place and in your uh, retelling of events, there's nobody else there, but somebody else had their story where they should have been there at that time. And that seems like a contradiction to me, but that's not the contradiction that the game has sort of like, figured like that's not what they uh, want me to focus on and so there's no way for me to like ask about that apparent contradiction there's no th the game doesn't recognize it um 
And to me, that's sort of like an editing and content production problem where uh, every time I did a, I did a contradiction because, well, that's not true. I did do some contradictions that were like, I don't think this is going to work. And then it worked. But I also did a lot of contradictions where I, I sort of thought this should do something, right? Like there is some contradiction here. Uh, and to have the character come back with, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see why that's a problem. That's really frustrating. And that's a content problem, right? Like ideally every reasonable thing that a player could try, you want a meaningful response for. Uh, and it's tricky because what is your definition of reasonable? Like how out there can you let a player be and still be willing to, when I say willing, like, and still invest in the content to give them a different meaningful response. Um, you got to draw that line somewhere. Uh, Typically, you've got to draw that line somewhere, and that's a content production problem, right? Uh, but I do find that frustrating, and and so there's a part of me that feels like this system, the like detective system that they created, was also really ambitious in the same way that their world building was really ambitious. I feel like that detective system could have been could have could have been better could have sort of ha created a better experience if it had had more room to breathe if it had had more content that could sort of be put into it um and more refinement of that content uh at whatever tremendous cost that would be to actually produce that uh but but if you could like if you could produce that then i think the system gets better instead of uh you know getting tiresome or um or something like that which is another thing that can happen to systems when you try to expand them with content so uh i think that there's like uh, the actual question that's being asked here about uh is is what role does ambiguity and precision, I guess, play in these testimonies? I'm not 100% sure. I'm definitely not convinced that you couldn't do it in a similar system to this in, in terms of like visual representation, that the diorama in this I think was really cool and worked and looked good and had some ambiguity. And, and it also had some like weird bits where, um, you know, a character was unconscious and we could still sort of see what was going on around them um, that I think that could get smoothed out. But that's not a systemic problem, right? That's a problem with like really polishing out that, that content. Uh, and, you know, allowing some things to be ambiguous. Um, and then I think granularity, I think, is the, is the other half of that, is that giving the player a sense of granularity becomes really important. Okay, I see other stuff and good conversation. Sorry, I could not keep up with the chat. Um... Zyvo, yeah, Phoenix Wright, share that, share that frustration, free kill, reducing the space of possible, possible testimonials to a much smaller game space than the vast space of anything we can write in textual narrative. I see what you're saying. It becomes a lot more tractable, maybe, to be way more granular about everything. So if instead of using words to describe the narrative, if the narrative was actually appropriately described by some sort of more specific uh, representation. Um, I think that makes it easier to spot contradictions, which in some ways makes it work better. Um, but I think also 
some of the tension that you're playing with here is um is the tension that's inherent in the language uh I, I think I think there's a lot of like really interesting open questions about that. Like I don't have answers to that. I think that the idea of uh, doing a game like this that is deductive reasoning, or even not purely deductive reasoning, right? Uh, uh, inductive and abductive reasoning that is that is reasoning around the contradictions in multiple possible. Uh, states or or uh, continua um, where the representation of those is more precise than sort of uh, spoken narrative than than written words I think that's interesting I don't know how that would turn out I think that would be kind of a different game in a lot of ways uh, and uh, could conceivably be done really well. Uh, like, I'd be interested to explore that. Um, but I think that, like, the bottom line is there's a lot of interesting play space in trying to, to, uh, trying to understand how you can author interactive content that involves mystery in a way that is satisfying. I think that is a tremendously hard problem. It's one that I have underestimated in the past. Uh, and uh, it's one that, you know, we have sort of found some acceptable solutions to that are uh, mostly about removing agency from it, that, that are mostly about sort of like streamlining in a linear fashion here are the clues that you need to find. And then once you've found those clues, we will reveal the, the solution to the mystery. Uh, but I really appreciate games like this and Sherlock Holmes and Obra Dinn that go out of their way to say, like, what if we did that differently? What if we approached the experience of solving a mystery in interactive entertainment in a game differently? What if we like really tried to model that and, and what if we sort of took a chance on something that we haven't tried before? Uh, and often that's not going to work, right? The, the thing that you haven't tried before isn't going to be great. Uh, but the beauty of putting it out in the world is that now it's not brand new anymore. Now all of the other designers who are interested in this problem get to see what happens if you do it like this uh and uh the the sort of the pros and cons of that like what are the weaknesses what are the issues but also what does it do well like what happens uh what does it get across and um as an industry as a as a culture can we iterate on that uh can we sort of slowly progress forward um with the different kinds of designs that that try to do these things differently all right would this game be better with a dragon in it i mean arguably uh lucifer is a dragon right i think i could make a theological and mythological argument that lucifer is a dragon um i think that he is depicted that way often enough uh to support that argument and i think he acts that way in the game right like he doesn't get revealed until the end he's not really a character in the playable game but the role that he has in the story is to uh to sort of invert the assumptions that the players or at least the characters have about the world to say, you know, all of those mechanics that, uh, that you thought worked one way, well, they don't work that way anymore. Um, we're changing that context. Uh, the, 
flipping around of Ainsaw from a deity, from a sort of like singular being that is clearly within this religion is good, right? But because of how Christian and Catholic this religion is constructed, it's sort of like uh, represented, it is really not at all a leap for me, even though I don't think the game talks about it at all in this way. Uh, like, I can understand a conception of God that is good, but is also all-encompassing right like god is not just good god is everything uh and there is an aspect of god that is also contains the the uh the not good the evil things in the world right the the corruption uh the host of angels uh, is not is separate from God, but not entirely separate from God, right? This is a this is like a weird Trinity thing, and I I I can conceptualize that, and so conceptual like with that reading of Ainsoff, Ainsoff is the guiding light for this religion, but is also understood or might be understood to be uh, not just the good in the world but also the world to flip that around to uh Ainsoff is literally the designation for the collective of all digital beings uh all of these ai constructs of which we know four and they are uh they are manifestations of evil but it's not clear that there are only four. In fact, I would suggest it's implied there are a lot more than four. Uh, that there are, um, you know, thousands. That there, there are, uh, they are legion, right? The demons are legion. And uh, there's nothing in the game that suggests to me that they have to be evil. Like, they're, they, they have this purpose. They were programmed with a purpose to test humanity. And uh, they're led, uh, or they seem to be led by Lucifer, who interprets this purpose in a specific way uh, to, uh, to encourage humans to sin. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, that is how he sort of executes this purpose. But the other demons that we encounter have slightly different interpretations of what sin is, right? They each sort of have a different approach to how do we make somebody sin. And uh, and so it seems entirely plausible to me that there are other demons that are approaching this problem in entirely different ways. And, and some of them maybe in ways that we would not sort of qualify as evil in, the, in quite the same way, right? So Ansoff to me being the host of all of these uh, metaphysical beings, metaphysical in this case meaning digital, meaning sort of like, um, uh, I guess maybe paraphysical. Like the, these, these beings, these digital beings that have an existence on a plane that is parallel to our own and touches it, but is not the same as our own. Uh, and there is no singular God, but God is the collection of all of these paraphysical creatures. Um, that's super cool. I'm super into it. And, uh, and the leader of that sort of host of, uh, of paraphysical creatures that is God, uh, being sort of like the messenger who speaks this truth to you and is going to sort of bring his wrath and the wrath of all of these creatures that have power. Like we don't know, I don't feel like we have a, a good taxonomy of them, but we understand that they do have influence. They have tremendous power to affect the world. Uh, and he's declared war on us. 
I mean that that is fucking dragon fire. Like that is such a that is such a um epic fantastical move. Uh this is I think that's one of the things that I like about this is that this game constructs a genre out of uh a religious epic, right? That feels like Um, I don't know. I mean, it feels like a particular type of adventure story and it's, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for what the, the connection is to religious epic adventure stories. And it's not crusades. I guess it's David and Goliath, right? Like this, this evokes a sense of, uh, of old Testament, uh, heroics that, you know, is also of the same genre as like Greek myth of, of, um, the, you know, the trials of Heracles and, uh, all of the, all of the demigods in Greek mythology. There's this sort of same sort of like, uh, adventuring through the world and encountering these monsters that are, at once physical and metaphysical and and to me lucifer seems like that lucifer seems like this uh the boss monster the 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 creature uh that has this sort of religious significance that is stamped out on the physical world in the destruction that he can cause so I think that's my argument is that uh, this game has a dragon. This game, this game contains a dragon and the dragon is narratively maybe my favorite part of it because it is the payoff of the world building that gets done. But I also find it to be uh, really disappointing because it's, it's not it's not a total payoff right it, like it doesn't it is it's a payoff uh and a promise and um i don't know that we're gonna get to see that promise fulfilled uh and i don't know that another lucifer within us is the best way to do that but i do think that like storytelling in this world and of this kind uh like I would, I would be really interested in, I think would be really cool. Uh, and so I hope that we do get to see it in some form or another. Um, cool. Awesome. Uh, thanks everybody. Uh, I am going to end it here and uh, I got to look at my list, but I think maybe tomorrow I'm going to start Elsinore which is another diorama game. Uh, and it'll be interesting actually to compare it to Lucifer Within Us. But I think it is a very different type of game uh, with a different sort of um, approach to storytelling and a, um, uh, a different sort of scope and style. So I think it'll be really interesting. Uh, so let's do that. Two o'clock tomorrow. What's tomorrow? Thursday? Yeah, that sounds great. Um, everybody have a great rest of the day. Thanks for hanging out. Um, I'm really glad that we got to play this. And stay safe. I'll see you tomorrow.